uh, talking about uh, Fauvism, this movement that was begun really in 1904, 1905, uh, the movement toward it, but the name stuck in 1905 at the Fall Salon, the Autumn Salon, Salon de Tom, which was independent from the official salons, but was a major venue for uh, 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 exhibitions at this time. Not only avant-garde art, right? Remember that the, the folks were in a room that had a Renaissance sculpture in it as well. And that's how they got the name. Uh, uh, Donatello, pardon me, it wasn't really a Donatello, they just used the term, like, for any kind of Renaissance sculpture. Surrounded by the wild beasts, and they called them wild because they looked consciously unschooled, right? It's really what they're, they're not really trying to look that way, but that's what they were saying, right? They're savages. Uh, why they called them wild beasts. And it's, in many ways, these folk were, uh, directly violated traditional modes of painting, what you would learn in the academy. Uh, through their uh, unblended use of colors, the, uh, the brightness and the saturation of them, the, the lack of black or outline, the lack of fidelity between the chosen color and the, and the object that it colors, right? You have to imagine Matisse looking out his window did not see wallpaper that was purple on one side of the room and then blue and green on the other, right? He's choosing the colors for their um, emotional impact. He wants them to affect the viewer, right? Uh, that way. He's not really seeing spiritual qualities in the colors, except for the fact that they affect your emotions. And he's also not looking for something uh, like an expressionist artist might. Um, but rather, he, he, he mentions that he wants his paintings to be um, like a good armchair that you settle into, the decorative qualities, right? And for a long time, the pieces works were derided for the decorative qualities. We'll, look, we'll talk a bit more about this, right? We didn't get a chance to look at the third of the major artists in the 1905 exhibition, which is Maurice de Flamenck. Um, uh, and you can see that each one of the three has a slightly different sort of take on the focus movement. Flamenck is a little bit more prone to darker colors. Uh, not always, but in the two that I'm going to show you, it's true. And also, uh, he has a tendency to use colors that approach, if not, are, are not actually black, which is something you don't really see in, in, in either André Durand or, or uh, Henri Matisse. Um, also, of the three, he was the one that was the most radical. He was the one that we might actually say, he's, he's a bit of a wild beast. Um, he, he wanted his paintings. He, he, he belonged to this French group called the Anarchists. They weren't like your Pacific Northwest unshaven types who were, you know, throwing bricks at Starbucks and things like that. They're not like that kind of anarchist. There was, in fact, an anarchist party, and they were really very, very progressive social party, right? And he felt that his paintings should be part of a, a progressive agenda. This is something he doesn't really share with Matisse or with Durant. But what Matisse saw in these different arts, he's the most important one, is he saw each of them doing things with color, primarily divorcing it from description doing things with color that he was doing as well. And he then wanted to bring these artists together, right? So Matisse is really the, the moving force. He's, he's what brings these guys together in 1905. He'd been working arm in arm with, uh, with Durand in the south of France, not with, with Flamenck. Flamenck was working just outside of Paris, right? But uh, Matisse, being uh, slightly older, more mature, is, is really helpful what other people are doing, right? And, and helps bring them together. Um, Another Flamenc from the National Gallery, a fairly recent one on display at least, uh, where you can see his colors are very, very different than Matisse. He doesn't Matisse and Durand have these sort of brighter, more primary almost, you know. They're, uh, you know, lots of oranges and, you know, sort of uh, sky blues, right, and, and light greens. And Flamencs are, are richer, deeper, more contrasty, you know. Uh, I think you can see that in each of these too. Uh, but especially if you look at the woman in the hat, right? The, uh, he becomes interested in the flowers in her hat, which is all terrific. Uh, but you'll notice how he treats the face where there's this, this, it's almost like this jaundice stripe in the middle, right? Where her face becomes this yellow, uh, through the center of her forehead, down her nose, and around her lips. And it almost obscures any kind of modeling on the sides of the nose. You know, no, we were talking last semester, noses are tough to draw anyway. You know, they really are. <laughs> it's around the 
problem, right? Don't even bother. And it's, <laughs> they get this yellow stripe right down the middle and this orange hook under her chin. That's part of the modeling of the chin, but it's not, is it? It's, it's, it's more about just the opportunity to arrange colors on a canvas. That's really what they're looking for, uh, the flow of artists. There were others as well. Uh, Matisse and Duran in the south of France, uh, who I remember here is near Spain, so it's on the Mediterranean. Both uh, Marquet and Dufy were working on the northern coast, uh, near the Havre, so they're in Normandy, right, uh, doing beach scenes there as well. So this is a group that, that is, there was about nine of them, six of them, right, so we've seen five of the six that, that uh, Matisse brought together in 1905 and garnered that nickname, um, the Wild Beasts, right? Um, now, it's a fairly short-lived uh, movement. As I mentioned, there's no sort of formal organization other than Matisse seeing people that he thought were doing what he was doing, right? That's really the only organizational principle um, was Matisse's interest in, in getting like minds together. But there isn't like the impressionist that, you know, a group showing that's planned as a group showing. And it lasts for all of about three years. By 1907, each of the primary artists that were in the folk movement are going separate directions. Right? Already by 1907. Even though really the first time they were seen together was 1905. So it doesn't take them very long to sort of if you want to split up, um, insofar as they were ever really together, right? And so for this brief moment, in the middle of the first decade, they're all exploring very similarly uh, color for its own sake, divorced from description. Color as applied to composition rather than objectivity, right? And for each of them, this really becomes a, a sort of a, an important touchstone for what they will do, right? Now, what I wanted to do is spend a little bit of time looking a bit more thoroughly at Matisse, because really he's one of the, uh, arguably one of the three or four most important artists of the 20th century. Uh, just for modern art, uh, very few figures move as large as Matisse does. He lives all the way to 1951, right? So halfway through the century, he's still alive and produces really fantastic pieces uh, with varying styles right up until the end, right? Right until he's crippled with uh, arthritis and uh, has survived cancer and uh, continues to paint through it all. So I wanted to kind of look at Matisse a bit more thoroughly. Um, I'm not going to go back to the early stuff from the end of the 19th century, but I did want to sort of look at what got him into into folkism because it really is his movement. Right? He's the one that brought the other guys together. Um, so uh, his first sort of rollout, if you will, the first big uh, display of this new sort of hyper-rich colorful style was this picture, um, which is in the Pompidou in, in Paris, but we should look at it anyway. It's huge, right? Um, it, well, it's about four feet across, so it's a very large canvas. And this was shown in 1905 as well, but in the spring, at a different independent art show called the Salon des Independents, right? Quite literally an independent art show. Uh, the Salon of the Independents. And all the other folks were there too. This is where Matisse first started gathering them around, but it wasn't until that fall that they got that notoriety, right? So they've been, they've been out there. People had seen them, uh, before. And, um, this work was Matisse's work in that in that spring show, and what we see are a, a series of women uh, picnicking on the side of the bay. It looks a little bit like the bay near Marseille, but it's hard to say exactly. Some Mediterranean inlet, and if you've ever been down there, they all look like this, right? These beautiful inlets, and not only for the color and the nude women, right? But they all look like this, uh, that sort of inlet. Uh, all painted with incredibly bright colors and applied somewhat differently than what we've seen before with the open window in a series of fairly large patches. Right? Matisse had trained under a few artists like, if you know him, George Seurat, the Sunday in the Park, uh, or Paul Signac, who had done what was called pointillism, single dots of paint. But he felt that was, he didn't like the way they blended. He didn't like the way you couldn't see the individual strokes. They wanted to make them bigger. 
Brent knows what he's doing here. So he's got these blended colors, but they don't really blend, right? The greens and the yellows. Right? Or the purples and the reds. Wine color there. He doesn't want them to blend together. He wants them to have a presence of their own. And so he, he takes that what's called pointillism and makes it uh, more patchy in color. Because he's older, right, he's 31 at the turn of the century, right? So when 1900 rolls around, he's already 31 years old. He was born right before the Impressionists even started. He was born in 69. And he trained in the 80s. 1880s, 1890s was when he's in the sort of, you know, his late teens and early 20s. And that means that he came into his artistic independence during the, during the period of the symbolists. And many of his early work, and even throughout the rest of his career, symbolism as a movement remains a sort of important legacy for him. Right? He keeps thinking about works of art in the way the symbolists have thought about them, about having other kinds of meanings that might come through that, that they might actually touch on mythology uh, and evoke sort of ancient themes and ideas that are part of all of us, a part of being human, right? And so, but at the same time, not really spelling anything up, but these, these women lounging around eating by the ocean have a sort of timeless quality about them. It's almost like he's trying to evoke uh, a golden age when uh, everything was perfect, right? Um, and, uh, you know, think of Adam and Eve before the fall, where you don't have to wear clothes, right? Uh, so he sort of caught them, even though there's a boat there, and even though, God, who knows what these UFOs are in the sky. Right, uh, but clouds are rendered in, in that way. He, he's evoking a, a simpler time when there's this harmony with nature, when the figure is in pure accord with the world around them. Um, that's what he's trying to catch at. And you'll notice that some of the figures, like the standing one in the middle, um, begin to sort of blend and almost look like they're part of the landscape, don't they? Look at the right side of, of this figure here, and you'll see that while this side is outlined more strongly, this kind of begins to sort of blend into this a series of colors, right? Uh, this figure down here also blends in. This figure turns backward to the bush and sees itself like a place in nature, you know? It's this harmony with the world is what he's, he's uh, really looking for uh, with this work. And as we saw with the, with the uh, symbolists, there was often a, a rebirth of interest in, in narrative. And so... I, with a lot of Matisse's works, they're very self-consciously reviving old ideas. And particularly, they seem to be in dialogue with earlier works of art. Matisse is very, very thorough in studying earlier works of art and then bringing those ideas into his. This is why we often, that's what Manet did, and that's why we think of him as being sort of the founder of this movement. So one of the things that came to my mind was the, the, the legend uh, of Diana and Astia. Diana is the goddess of the hunt. And Acheon is a young hunter who accidentally stumbles onto Diana with um, her entourage bathing in the woods. And so this is a moment in this Titian picture, so it's a Venetian Renaissance picture. He's, he's looking in there, she is, and she's looking out. You know. and, and it's got him in all sorts of trouble, right? Diana didn't like being seen naked, and so she turned the hunter Actian into a deer, and his dogs ate him. Like, it always seems unfair to me. Poor Actian looks like stalking her, and he accidentally stumbled on her. What a jerk. Her. Right? I'm not using the other word. Right? Because I'm being recorded. But there he is at the moment of discovery. What's happening here is just like you're acting, aren't you? In a way, if you think about this idea of where do you encounter nude women in the woods, then the, the myth of Diana and acting is one of the places where we see it in art. But in this one, there's nobody stumbling in on them. So that makes you acting on, in a way. You know, you've encountered these things in nature. And there's other stories. There's not multiples. There's David and Bathsheba, where he's spying on her in, in the Bible. There's there's um, Susanna and the Elders, also in the Old Testament, where we, 
elders of the church are spying on her while she's at the bath. All of those are about the sort of illicitness of watching women bathe from a male point of view. And I think that Matisse kind of grabs onto part of that as well. So I mentioned the symbolist um, elements of this picture. The title comes from a symbolist poet, Charles Baudelaire, a novelist and a poet, um, and really one of the primary uh, constituents of symbolist poetry. He wrote this uh, poem called Invitation to uh, uh, Travel, Invitation to Voyage. And in that, the line that he's quoting for the title, Luke's calm a group day, uh, luxury calm and exoticness, right? The luxuriousness, right? Uh, that comes from a line, uh, from Baudelaire, there is only order and beauty, is the poem, right? There's only order and beauty, richness, calm, and sensuality. Luke's calm a group day. And by making reference to that line of this poem, Matisse points to something that for him is also incredibly crucial. There is only order and beauty. And that's not the part he quotes, he quotes the rest of the book. But that's what he's referring to. There is only order and beauty. That is, that is his agenda, this painting, is to create a world of order and beauty. And in this case he does it in two different ways. By the subject matter, this again, golden age that he evokes with multiple references to past art. And secondly, through the style, the arrangement of colors on the canvas. He intends to be their order and beauty. This was begun just after the Fauve shows. And you can already see that he's kind of going somewhere else already. But at the same time, these two pictures side by side show uh, quite a bit of what's kind of interesting and important, and they share quite a bit of ideas. The Joy of Life, or, you know, James Schwadadipa. And um, this is up in Philadelphia, the Barnes Collection um, in Philadelphia, which you couldn't take pictures of up until about 10 years ago. So it was one of the things where you could, it was very hard to teach, uh, the Joy of Life. Uh, but you can see very similar ideas to what we have here. We have uh, people lulling about in a perfect, idyllic landscape. Remember that Matisse was an art collector. He owned some of Gauguin's Tahitian works, so we can begin to see that, yeah, okay, there's almost a direct line you could, you could draw between the two of these guys, right? Women lulling about in a, in a paradise somewhere, right? Often unclothed. Um, and that's exactly what Matisse is giving us as well. A primitive past where everything is perfect, right? It's timeless here. And it's huge. It's eight feet across. It's the biggest painting he had ever made in his entire life up to this point. And this is something that's kind of important to consider. Right? It's a, I never will test you on sizes of paintings, but you should pay attention to that. Because when artists make a work that's bigger than anything they've ever done, maybe it's time to sit up and pay attention. Because they're saying something to us. And this is important. Right? Uh, this is, uh, uh, there's something in here that you should you should really pay attention. Otherwise, why make it that big? Right? Uh, so uh, again, eight feet across, uh, almost five and a half feet tall. Right? Uh, so it's really difficult to fit that in this room. Right? It's almost that's not five and a half feet tall. There, it's bigger than what's projecting on the wall at this point. Right? Um, Still very symbolist, I think, in a lot of ways, in the fact that it, it's elusive, right? Elusive, it makes allusions to things, right? It's elusive, it doesn't really nail anything down. At the same time, it seems to be interested in uh, symbolisms that come out of mythology, but again, not directly narrating them, a very personal take on it. Quite like if we think about Radon with the Pandora image that we saw, right? It's a very personal take on that. Or his Beatrice image, where it doesn't, there's nothing there to suggest Dante, but, except for the title, right? Um, at the same time, these are, these 
are figures in revelry, aren't they? They're, they're, it's hedonism. They're just, they're, they're gratifying themselves with pleasure. It sounds like you to say it that way. But you, you, when you look at the picture, you know what I mean, right? It's all about self-indulgence. Um, nobody's working, right? Uh, the only thing that they're doing is doing something to make themselves happy. That's hedonism, right? And that's certainly when we look back at symbolist art, there's often this sort of hedonistic side to it. Why does Rodone put all those flowers underneath Pandora? Because it's, it's pleasurable to look at, right? It's a hedonistic kind of painting. And Matisse picks that up as well. Right? So, again, uh, symbolism for him is a strong legacy and runs through these works uh, right around the folk period as well. Um, Here's a sense of scale, right? Just so you know. There's a picture I knocked off the web somewhere. I ripped this one off, but I didn't take it. Um, but people looking at the at the picture, just so you have a sense of what we're talking about. So it's a visual manifesto, right, of what he's intending to do. Now that and he begins it sort of just as the foe thing hits the fan, right? The foe hits the fan. Uh he's it, once it it becomes a bit clearer that the critics are are, are, are interested in the fact that he is his works are extraordinary and modern and avant-garde. Once that becomes clear from these two exhibitions in outside, he starts this picture works hard for this year. So what he's doing is he's embracing that criticism, right? And he's helping develop these ideas and come out with this magnum opus uh, that uh, proclaims everything he wants to do. And... Um, in order to work on this, what he does is he, is he, he sort of works through each of the figures very, very thoroughly. Each one of them. I can go, we can go on for days on this picture. It's a really fascinating piece. Okay. But each of the figures seems sort of front loaded with references to the history of art. And if we think about it as his magnum opus about, hey, I'm Matisse and this is what I'm doing and this is my place in the history of art. Then the more you look at the joy of life, the more you realize that it is a, a culmination, a summary of everything that's ever happened in painting. Going all the way back to cave painting, if you think about it, some of the figures don't look like cave paintings, just simple outlines. Prehistoric man, 20,000 BC, right? Everything from there through. And so I wanted to just give you an idea of what I'm talking about. I, I wanted to sort of highlight one or two of the figures here to sort of show you sort of how Matisse pulls this out. Right? So the figure on the left uh, doing her hair goes back to images of Venus having arisen from the bath. And we can find these either in Roman sculptures, which are copies of Greek originals, or we can find it in Renaissance pictures. I didn't bring them in. Or this is Ang, I-N-G-R-E-S, a 19th century French painter, neoclassical. Right? And he's taking those themes, and he's coming up with something new. In this case, he's not just wringing her hair, but she seems to be draping herself in flowers, right? But it picks up from these themes. Um, the reclining figure with her back to us. Um, you ladies might remember this from Rome, right? Uh, the sleeping hermaphrodite at the top uh, was a very, very well-known image. But then we get chances to Baroque Spanish pictures like Velazquez's uh, Rock of Venus, right? All seem to derive, and then Matisse has got his, his own variation on that, right? The figure immediately next to her is a figure that Matisse loves, a figure reclining, leaning on one arm with the other arm over her head like that, is a direct reference anybody who knows to Ariadne, who is Dionysus's girlfriend, right? Uh, lived on an island with Dionysus and was uh, had wound up on the island washing ashore. She'd been ditched at sea by uh, Theseus. Right? She'd helped Theseus. Remember, okay, the myth of Theseus and the Minotaur? Got that? that Theseus and the Minotaur, right? So, so he goes and plays the Minotaur and, and, and Minos' daughter, Ariadne, gives him the threat. Right? And she gives him the threat so he can find his way back out of the maze. And so he takes him with her, and her sister. And he dumps her because he falls in love with the sister, right? And he dumps her in the water. He goes all overboard on the way back to Athens. And, 
so she, she nears the drowns and she washes up on shore, right? And that's what she is now. This is the sleeping Ariadne. She's washed up on shore. And the, the island of Naxos, which is still there, you can still go, right? Is where Dionysus lives. And so he revives her, right? Brings her back to life, if you will, in the substitution. And she lives the rest of her days. Lucky, so she got a lucky look. Right? Hey, who do you want? You want the muscle down hero who kills half men, half soldiers? You want like this with a crowd of women on a green island? Like, there is no point. Right? Yeah. So anyway, this is the this is the most famous classical image of Ariadne. Again, this is in the Vatican, right? Uh, and that's a standard post. But other artists have picked up on it. So here's another hang. This is in Baltimore, actually, um, of a, a harem scene, right? But Matisse is aware of these prototypes that start way back then and trace their way through various spaces. Right? He's going to bring them all in here, right? Rope them all in. <coughs> the figures in the center dancing. Um, also, Greek mythology. Uh, some of Dionysus' compatriots on Naxos were Mayans who spent a lot of their time dancing to music, and you can see this the flutist as the mind dance around this Greek pot. Uh, this is something uh, John Coffin's university has in our collection. Right, that's what, that's what Jimmy G was saying. Here, but there are the dancing mind dance, and you can see that the, the figure with the pipe uh, is picked up all the way over here, although it's a shepherd at that point, right? And those are the slides I've tried to look at the students who can play the high school game. But every one of these visual groupings, right, just like for you to pass by the end of the each one of these has its based on strong legacy leading through art. Uh, with the dancing by I think he's also thinking of Botticelli, uh, the famous Primavera picture um, in in uh, Florence, where we have the same dancing figures there. So, again, the joy of life is to Matisse a, a visual formation of the history of art, right? And as such, it's intended as part of his statement about, like, this is what I'm doing. I have a place here, right? This is my table. And I'm, I'm going to bring something new to this. The other reason I'm, I'm focusing so much on this work that we don't have is it's also incredibly important for Matisse's career. Because from this point forward, right, this is the first painting after the faux brouhaha. And many of the figures that he worked on for the joy of life will become motifs that he continues to work on in other paintings as he moves forward from here. Right? These themes are important to him. They're not just haphazardly chosen figures. So, for example, the dance figures are one of his most famous works, this uh, wonderful dance figure uh, picture in, in in St. Petersburg. It was made for a Russian collector. A pair of pictures, and these are huge, too. They're about nine feet across, right? And there's one of music, uh, one of dance and one of music uh, made for this Russian collector. And uh, you can see it's just a reversion of this, and he will revisit it on multiple occasions, right? And even going back more strongly to the Greek uh, vase painting tradition by making the figures red, like red figure vase painting. Right? But again, color harmonies, right? So they're just strikingly decorative, strikingly beautiful as well. Um, the Ariadne figure comes up again and again, not only in his paintings, but also in his sculptures. This one's up in, in Baltimore at the Baltimore Museum of Art, so it's a local work, right? And you can see that she derives directly from that central figure that we just looked at. Matisse uh, had actually gone to North Africa and had become very, very much interested in African tribal art. And at the same time, there was, beginning in the 1890s, uh, an ethnographic museum in Paris that was showing these things. Now, we don't know exactly what things he collected, but we know that he did collect. And, uh, right, so there is a, a, the kinds of things he was buying. And the distortions to the body parts that we see in the blue nude um, are, in fact, things that are derived from uh, African sculptures, using these as a way of, of making something new, bringing something different to the traditions. Um, that he's, that he's working in, right? Uh, so he's buying pottery, he's buying textiles as well. Um, the North African Islamic textiles because he wants the color, right? 
and he's bringing these things into his work as and using them as the basis for um, a way of finding an art that is that isn't traditional anymore, despite the fact that he's using traditions, right? Uh, and that's I think what makes it so fascinating. Right. So this sets the stage for where he's heading. Um, the areas of color grow broader, brighter, even from the faux period. And what we find is we trace Matisse's career from here on out. Uh, I'm not going to look at that, but obviously I'm going to look at a few of the heavy hitters. You can see he's always interested in color, right? Here's a, his studio where he paints, where everything is red, well, almost everything, right? And what's interesting is the stuff that isn't red are nature and art. His paintings aren't red. His pencils aren't red. His handmade pottery isn't red. But the chair is, right? The table is, the clock is, right? He's uh, letting the color permeate everything. And this was done after he continued to immerse himself in non-Western, non-European art, right? African sculpture was important early on. Uh, Islamic textiles become even more important. He goes in 1910 to a major exhibition of Islamic art that was held in Germany, in Munich. This is a postcard from the exhibition, right, where he saw not only Islamic textiles, uh, but them actually being made on the loom. And that idea of different colored fabrics weaving together into this world of, of color and pattern. Right, look at this, look at the space there. Everything is color, everything is patterned. Uh, he's taking those ideas and applying them to his interiors as well. Um, to photos, two postcards from this exhibition. And like I said, Matisse was here just adored it as well because of his interest in color. Um, through a lot of the 20th century, Matisse was derided in modern art because um, we, art historians, have a bias. We want our modern art to be socially engaged. We want our modern art to be speaking truth to power. Right? So the legacy of the Expressionists, for example, should be socially relevant. And the piece was primarily decorative. And this was to his disadvantage. Right? He, uh, in, in critical eyes. And this, I never really liked that idea because I love Matisse. I just think if I could live with these things. I mean, because he, he, as he gets past the faux period and he begins to develop his ideas about color, um, they become these places where you want to live. Right? So there's an Ariadne sculpture in the garden. Right? There's a painting on the wall that's one of his paintings uh, on the wall. In fact, here it is. Right, uh, but he's changed the colors to fit the color scheme of the interior, and it's, it's, it's art and music and life and human and humanity. Right, here's is that him? I think it is reading, smoking a cig. Uh, somebody else sitting in the garden. They're not quite sure what she's doing. She looks, he hasn't bothered to tell. She's knitting, petting the cat. You know, he's enjoying the garden, and then the mother giving a, a great little piano lesson. Uh, to his son. Everything is art and music, isn't it? That's so important for Matisse, is, is the role that art can play in, in in making your life a better thing, right? Go back a second. That's why with the Red Studio, it's the art that isn't red. It's not obscured by this, right? Everything else doesn't matter. That the rest of them doesn't matter. What matters is the art. And that's the statement that Matisse is making with these. And that's where I think this, this question of whether or not he's relevant, you know, is, is kind of a moot point because there's something really powerful about this. Now, this one was painted, look at the year, 1916-1917, right? Why do we in art history worry about years? Because context is everything. Matisse was, uh, wanted to join the war because everybody did. It was the national patriotic thing to do in 1914. He was rejected because he had some, like, ear infection or something like that. I mean, it's also at the time, um, by that time, almost 50, right? So he's older than your standard grunt, 
right? And in addition to this, he's, he had uh, a medical issue that allowed him not to participate. Listen, he's at home. He's in Paris, right? Uh, the rest of the younger folks have all gone off to the war, you know? Picasso's had to go back to Spain, right? He knows Picasso. And, and so he's stuck, right? He can't go. And, and, and it's crashing around him, right? The front is not that far from, from Paris. A hundred miles north is the fighting. And what is he doing instead? Is he's home and he's creating amid all of that carnage. He's creating peace and harmony in a world. And I think there's something really wonderful about that. You don't necessarily have to make pictures of the war to address the issue of the war. Right? You can make pictures of what the world should be like. Put down the gun and pick up a violin. You know? That's kind of the message of Matisse. And, uh, anyway, this is, I, I think these are really terrific pictures. And this idea of this idyllic home life that he seems to champion repeatedly in his works um, takes on a particular nuance or a particular specialness um, during World War I, uh, simply because he's, he's creating that comfortable armchair I keep talking about, right? A place to go and relax at the end of the day. Um, I'm trying to think if I have the exact quote. Yeah, an art of balance, of purity, of serenity. Is that nice, right? Balance, purity, and serenity. The void of troubling or depressing subject matter. Something like a good armchair in which to rest from physical fatigue. Um, if you don't have a good armchair, get one. Right? Very good thing to have. Um, my dog's destroyed mine. Uh, so many of his um, paintings are these incredibly luxurious interiors where we can see the impact of the, of, of the textiles he's been interested in. Uh, walls become this amazing display of colors. Um, and again, it's, it's peace and harmony. Uh, music, checkers, art on the walls. There's a, a copy of a Michelangelo uh, on the side table behind him. His paintings on the wall. These interiors are always about the role of art in making our lives a better place, right? Uh, we see it again and again. Um, I'm just going to sort of blast through a couple of late Matisse's because they just, they just keep morphing a little bit, but always Matisse. And always an interest in, in, in phenomenal rich color from the folk experience. But uh, sometimes more descriptive than others, right? closer to objective reality, sometimes less so. Uh, but always, uh, I don't know, I find them incredibly moving and also in, in, incredibly deliberate in the way that he's choosing to, what parts he decides he wants to, to spend the time modeling or molding and what he doesn't. Um, how parts of her hat will disappear or meld into the sides how the orange grate outside the slats is nothing more than just some thin paint to make the the bars on the on the on the uh, patio outside. Right uh, during the war in 1917, he actually moved out of Paris because of the war, and he moved to the south of France. He moves to the city of Nice, right on the Riviera, which again is gorgeous, right? and he spends the rest of his life there, living in the south of France because of the color, and because of the lifestyle, right, uh, appeals to him, and this is where he's been, you can go visit his studio in Nice, it's still there, right, uh, I like dogs, so I brought this woman, right, but you get a sense of his house, right, in the south of France, and I think he had his little dog sleeping under the table, but again, it's just, there's, there's, you know, the dog found his armchair, right, uh, but that, that wonderful tree, Right, that, that potted plant uh, in that amazing pot, and then all of the different patterns that just, you know, they, they make the floor sit flat, the space doesn't really recede, and what you end up with are these, this, it's almost like a, a quilt of, of different textiles coming together, different colors, and, and always with the intent of trying to create a sort of perfect decorative harmony. Aren't these great? I wish I could paint like Matisse, where's the guts? 
I think it takes guts to sort of stop trying to make it look like you see it. And that's a very bold move. And part of the reason I do art history now instead of art, I, I had I'm a studio art major as well, right, back in the day. A very long time ago. 30 years ago this year, I got my, uh, my bachelor's degree. It's been that long. And I was slow as a seven-year undergrad because I never saw my advisor. And I kept taking classes I wanted. And it was, and it was cheap back then. It was like 500 bucks a semester. State school in Oregon. I, I worked my way through undergrad. and didn't have a dime in debt. And then I screwed all the time from grad school. But I look at these things now and I go like, God, I wish I could do that. And even to this day when I pull out a pencil, it's like I, I try to be as realistic as I can and I can't break it. I can't stop. And I want to do that. I want to make a dress where I stop worrying about whether or not I got the folds right. I'm really more interested in the pattern and the color and the beauty of it, right? That's what makes these pictures, I think, so terribly wonderful. Uh, the way he handles the, uh, the carving on that table, right? That's just a piece of cheap furniture. You see them in garage sales all the time. People can't give them away, you know, with those doors on the side. People buy the laminated crap, right? But he, he, he gets rid of the trying to make it look like it looks, and he's using it as decorative patterns, right, that end up giving it a visual interest. Um, just coming up with the floor, instead of going back and sitting flat on the surface and giving it that diamond pattern. Uh, and, it, and then the way he doesn't paint the flowers, right? He's painted everything else around it, but uh, a space for the flowers to go. And then he comes back in and he sort of, but he doesn't bring them right up to the edge, and you're kind of aware of how he put it all together. I think it's fantastic. Fantastic. Toward the very end of his career, because of his arthritis, um, he ended up making these things that he, we now call the cutouts. And there's a whole room at the National Gallery of Matisse cutouts. And what he would do is he'd take pieces of construction paper and he would color them. Right? Whole large sheets of construction paper. Color them with paint. And then he would cut them out and collage them together, tack them down. Usually tacking them down with pins first before he glued them down, but he's simply doing cuts, right? So the only painting really is the coloring of the sheets, right? Those are hand-colored sheets of paper. And these are huge. Um, I, I had a picture of my wife standing next to this. I, I, I cut it because we were running along. Um, but if you stood here, I, I took this like this. I don't know how much more reflection. I stand to have to do it. This is the best part of yeah. Um, so he tried to make parts of the fill your environment, you know? And in the cut room, there's all them, they're like 20 by 30 feet. There's kind of some that are just blue figures, and some that are shells, right? Some that are just power locations. They're amazing, right? And, and the colors are just, again, it's they're what has been great about the piece all along. It's green, and it's oranges, and it's blue. Like that swirl And you know, it's the beasts of the sea, right? Uh, that's not it. So what are they? There's seahorse you see here. He's really divorcing it from that. There's sea urchins, right? There's different forms. Uh, as well. Uh, but there's most sort of the water of the Mediterranean, which is like this, right? So in me, it's really right on the coast of the Mediterranean. They have a couple of details of this as well.
she was talking to him about art and was very interested, and, and she got him a commission to decorate a chapel just outside of Nice in the town of Florence. And it's, it's amazing. And he did, this, he did his designs for the stained glass, took it to Craftsman's for it. Now, they made the designs for the stained glass so that the light would just change the interior everywhere we look. Did uh, these painted tiles for the walls. Right, so there's a Madonna and child with these flower patterns behind. But he doesn't color those because he wants the lights from the walls to go toward it, right? To reflect on it. It's a very simple, very small chapel, but it's, it's just utterly fantastic uh, in the town of Bronx. So if you ever have a chance, right, it's, uh, it's well worth the trip. And the wait is almost always a crowd, right, when you go. Because everybody's heard about this. And you can see there's this uh, aquatic motif um, behind the altar. He designed the altar as well, right? Uh, designed the space with the windows just on the one side. There he is. There's old Henri. Uh, worked on it for about three years, died in 1951, but this is him at the end of his career. So, um, again, I think it's worthwhile looking at what happened in the piece after the focus movement because there are very few artists in the 20th century with such a strong and varied legacy of, of painting, right, of art since then. And, uh, just, uh, and again, I'm a huge fan. And since I'm up here, I get to choose, right, who I skip and who I focus on. And I love the piece. Yeah. No, because the folk group, I think, the thing that's me about folkism, you you will see him referred to as such, but I, you, so you're talking about whether if somebody's writing about Matisse's chapel and doing a review of it in the newspaper, would they say, the folk came to Henri Matisse? I don't think so, right? Um, my guess is no. And, and part of it is, again, because each of these artists goes in such kind of drastically different directions. And Matisse is the only one I really wanted to. There are the 14 spaces of the cross on the back wall behind it, right? That's what's done. So, he's sitting right, right here in the chapel. It's a very, very small place, right? Um, and it's attached to this Dominican convent, right? So, uh, yeah. a nice... Uh, this is also Matisse in a nutshell, right? Take the... What a, what a strong tradition for art, the church, right? Stained glass. Long... A hefty legacy, and he can send you something drastically different and new with it, right? Okay, so there, now we're going to move on to Jesus and what you guys did your responses on uh, for today, which is really very, very different um, from folkism, um, especially as you can see, I'll look right off. There's no color at all, right? It's almost monochrome. Uh, and in fact, one of the principal parts of cubism for Picasso, um, and George Brock, who we'll look at as well, is the idea that they're more interested in form than they are with color. At the same time, if you go back and look at earlier PowerPoints, you can see that really on a certain level, both Cubism and Solism come out of Cezanne, with the way he was using these sort of... Remember Cezanne said, treat nature through the cone and the cylinder, the sphere, right, geometric forms, again, the paint with these patches of, geometric patches of color. Matisse grabs the color, Picasso grabs the structure, right, and cubism comes really directly out of that. And part of it comes, the first step towards cubism, which we'll look at on, on, on Tuesday, um, come out of the fact that there was a retrospective of Cezanne's work when he died in 1906. And Picasso went. And somebody said, what do you think? And he said, oh, he's the father of us all. So I have to acknowledge the strength of that text. So Cubism. Cubism is actually a term that was given to the movement by Matisse. He saw these things early on. He didn't much care for them. He said, it looks like a bunch of little cubes. Right? And again, remember, he's older. Right? They've got a bunch of little cubes, cubes. And that gave the movement his name. They, okay, that's good. We'll, we'll, we'll stick with that. Right? So he's responsible for, for naming this movement, right? Um, cubism. So, uh, one of the most influential mo movements in modern art, I see more people <coughs> picking up on cubism, uh, applying what Picasso had pioneered, uh, 
than almost any other movement in the early part of the 20th century. It has our movements that are already going. Even the teens, for a moment, sort of picks up cubism in the, in the teens, right? Starts to play with some of its conventions and goes back to the stuff. Right? Everybody sees this as this is amazing. And, and what is the, the basic root of this? Really, for cubists, uh, what we find in cubist painting, if we're going to sort of typify the style, talk about what makes a cubist painting interesting, one is it's relatively monochrome. Right? Two, it looks like a bunch of translucent cubes. And the way that Picasso achieves that is that when he looks at an object, and these are always representational, even if they don't look it, they are meant to be representational. What he does is he makes things that are solid look like they're transparent. And he makes things that are transparent look like they're solid. So in other words, you know, in a, in a, in a basic design class, we often talk about a figure ground relationship, right? Where it's just positive and negative space, right? The positive space is what's filled up with the, the object you're representing and the negative space is the area around it, right? And we often talk about paying attention to the negative space. What Picasso wants to do is to level that playing field. Right? There isn't a positive and negative space. It all is the same. And in order to do that, he has to make the negative space become positive space. Right? The transparent thing solid. At the same time, he has to meet it halfway by making the solid space, the positive space, transparent. And that way, everything within the composition, there is no figure versus ground on the norm. Everything has an uh, uh, equal role to play in the overall composition. Is that clear? It's a tough concept, right? So the backgrounds look like solid. It makes it harder to read. The backgrounds look like solid figures. And as he's painting these different sections, whether they're voids or solids, which there is no distinction anymore. Uh, Picasso and also Brock pay a significant amount of attention to how they're painting that section. So you'll notice as you look into the different cubes that uh, the signs of the construction are there, right? The paint strokes remain. So that they built up almost as if you were shading it or drawing it with the brush, right? Uh, so they're not simply painted by any means. Yeah, very deliberate act, right? So, this particular phase of cubism is called analytic cubism. Okay? Uh, and this is this first phase, 1910 or so to 1912 or so. Right? Maybe a little bit earlier. Sometimes lasting a bit longer. And the term comes from the fact that in analytic cubism, what you do is you analyze what you see. And it doesn't mean to analyze something. It means you break it apart, right? You break it down to its constituent elements and you figure out what they are. That's what analysis is, right? Even, even psycho, psychological analysis, right? Your, your shrink's going to break it down with you. What does this mean? What about that part? What about that part? Because we tend to look at the entire thing, right? And not at the constituent elements. So, analytic cubism breaks things down. They, they look at the world, they analyze it, they break it down, they deconstruct it. And then they put the results of that deconstruction onto the canvas. Right? In other words, they reconstruct it as a composition. But in doing so, they bring, they make sure that they're picking up the, the negative space as well as the object they're looking at. So composition, again, becomes the most important thing. How is it put back together again? And when we talk about this reconstruction of the elements that they've analyzed, right, when they reconstructed, they brought colors, so you look at form, right, lose color, you use these aggressive brush strokes, but they also begin to evoke the object in a way that allows you to 
understand it better than if you'd just seen it in nature. Okay? Now, for Picasso, what this means is that often with a cubist picture, when he's deconstructed and reconstructed, he reconstructs it by abandoning the age-old idea of perspective, of the fixed viewpoint of the viewer. Okay? So when we make, you know, kind of random pictures that you stand here, you build a frame, and there I am, and I'm going to tell you, and I don't move. Right? I stand still, and I'm going to give you, right, and we get our models to come back and take these out. can't pose it. And what Picasso does when he reconstructs it is he's going to come in, and I'm going to look at Seth, and I'm going to say, okay, this part of the is going to be I'm going to put it back together so some of it I'll see from here, but some of it I'll see from here. And by doing that, by reconstructing it from multiple viewpoints rather than a single fixed viewpoint, Picasso thinks he can be believe he will be able to convey more information about the thing as a result of this analysis than you could see in the first place. Right? So human pictures almost always convey multiple viewpoints. Right? You see things from the front and from the side at the same time. And that's a direct violation of the entire history of painting in Europe, really, since the Renaissance. Where things are seen from a single view. One point of view. And it also suggests that one of the things that's really important about viewing art is you, the viewer. Because they make the, they bring into the discussion your experience. Time elapses in front of those people's pictures. It captures the fourth dimension. Because it does in a static object, it does what you do in the world. And this picture allows us to then do that. Let's see if they can respond to the picture. It may complicate, it may make it more difficult, but that means the discovery becomes that much more special. of analytic cubism, right, is this incorporation of uh, uh, the fourth dimension, movement, not the object, the object stays still, it's you, and that shifts part of the focus away from this to what you bring to it, to your experience, and what we'll find as we look at a lot of cubist pictures is the degree to which they are very much interested in evoking your experience. In novel, groundbreaking ways. Right. Now, um, another new. This was in Philadelphia. Another new email. Uh, can we read it? Can we find her there? Um, our picture on the left. The new woman on the left, right? And on the right is a little bit easier to figure out because the figure ground hasn't gone so far as this one has, right? Uh, in that you can start to say, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm getting. Chin, lips, nose, eyes, and those that get from the side, right? Uh, and seeing parts of bodies, and then maybe checking out shoulders, what might be either a shoulder or a breast, or maybe down here at the side, and I've seen it. You can begin to start to see it, see the figure, right? Just so with the knee being a part of the body. Much more difficult for what is in the next one. Can you make any part of it out? Every time I shove it, don't just do the same thing. I still have to do it. What he wants me to do is what he's done is drag it into the thing. And not put every part back together again. So that the part refers to the whole without actually doing it. Does that make sense? In a way that you think about, like, if you had a photo of someone's eye and you could identify them from just that photo,
potentially. Right? So you see, you understand. Are we getting any head up in here? Not right there. Right there. Like that. Could this be an elbow? Picasso's never totally abstract, right? That's why, I mean, they're never, ever in his career does he lose the references to the natural world. They're there somewhere. We happen to own one of the hardest ones to read, right, to put together. Because you end up with these angles up here. This could be the same. I, I'm not, I don't know if it's as easy as they're just being one as well. Because if this is the face, there's nothing that says that can't be the back of the head. Because again, it's been analyzed, right? It's been deconstructed and then put back together. And the rules that govern putting it back together are not what you saw at the beginning. The rules are how does it fit into this rest of the That's the rule that the rest of the right? That's the rule that is primary. So representation takes a back seat, right? And you can lose that along the way. Somebody once pointed out to me that uh, all the time I just saw everything and then I lost it, right? So I can't trace it upwards. Um, there is some question about whether or not all of this can be tied to what's going on in science. And the reason is we don't know how well people knew Einstein did in the That says that nothing in the world that you view is as fixed as all of that, that you and the way that you move changes the way you perceive. I'm basically you. I don't, I'm not a quantum physicist. I'm not the idea of the right? But basically, the theory of relativity is that our perception of matter is relative to our position in space and our movement. And this is a no time. And Picasso begins to start to a few years later. So, those are steps along this route that he has Right? So, it's a possibility. But there's often seen in the literature of uh, white Cubism is whether or not uh, these groundbreaking ideas about the world around us might have some impact on how Picasso and his team brought to look at are coming up with a new way of looking that says that the way you see something is based on your movement. The way you understand something is based on your movement around it. Because right? that's really what these are all about. Now, we don't have a lot of really good analytic Judas pictures here in D.C., so I thought just to get an idea of it, right, just to, so you get sort of this ism, if you will, this, this movement in modern art. Uh, I thought we should see some others that are slightly easier to read and this to give you a sense of what we're looking at. This is really our only great analytic cubist work in the DC area. So here are a couple of, um, the portrait of the art dealer Villar, uh, is, um, I think it's in the Pushkin Museum in Russia. Uh, but you can read it much more clearly. It's almost as if you're looking through, um, a kaleidoscope. You know? And all of a sudden, some things are just like crystal clear. Like the lips right here. And it's almost like you've seen right in that part in the kaleidoscope where there isn't any prism, you know, and you actually see something rather than all those facts that you notice. And then it just breaks up everywhere else. And it's so weird. And the cowboys must be able to tell you that hair like mine, right, on the side but not on the top. Right? And, 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 and even probably the beard, too. Like this could be fucking me. Right? Scowl a bit more, maybe some brown glasses. Um, this is, uh, Tom Hunter was also an uh, art dealer. He was the guy that set up Picasso and Brock. And you can start to see his hair and his body on the table. But again, it's been, it's a, the areas that are back there, it was, was inspired back there, but I didn't get strong of all or something, have been turned into the same sorts of rectilinear patterns that we see up in the world. So uh, it's worthwhile well seeing a few of these. I've got one more, I think, or two more to show you. Before we break, uh, two more Picasso's. Uh, music was incredibly important to them as well, just as it was to uh, to Matisse, right? I hope Matisse wanted music. But there are a lot of modern artists who 
around the theme of music uh, being incredibly important. And I think that's because for the early 20th century, music was thought to be a pure art form, the purest art form. It didn't have narrative. Well, it does, but that's not what they thought. Right? They thought it didn't have narrative. It was a pure art. And art, for art's sake, is only thing it did, oh, it's the only rule of something, for its internal aesthetic rules. So if we give them a, a, a custom of music and making art like music. And this is why sometimes abstract paintings with a kind of like composition. Because they're the term that's used for music. And uh, association with music. So, so for Picasso in particular, musical instruments, and particularly the guitar, seem to be incredibly important. For Picasso, the guitar is Spanish, right? He's moved to French Spain, so the guitar is a, a traditional Spanish instrument. We'll find his Spanish in a lot of his paintings. Right? But violins are there as well. And no one has a guitar on the right. You can see there's a sound box just next to the white trapezoid to the bottom. And the lines that come across horizontally are the screws. Right? But that's all the guitar that you get. And then you might pick up something at the edge of the guitar somewhere else. Right? I think the problem with all kinds of guitars is that it's a sort of knotty kind of guitar. So the guitar is shaped like a lady. Right? It's just a lady. And I think he liked that curve. Of the guitar, um, the, the violin player on the left, you see, some gets to become more literal the ears and hands. Um, you can start to then see also the frets, uh, the, the soundboard openings from the violin very clearly, and a diagonal that looks like it might go through the bow right, coming in. But musical references are for uh, Picasso and for the Cubist, uh, an incredibly strong uh, element. And then finally, Brock. Picasso and Brock were developing this idea. We, we talk about Cubism and it's Picasso's idea, but it isn't. And um, we'll talk about this more on Tuesday. But Brock, George Brock and Picasso shared a studio together. 1909, it was, it was either Volar or Conwag. It was Volar that put them together, the art dealer. And I should share a studio. And then 1909, for the next five years, they were together in the studio. Until the war, when Picasso died and go back. Right. And uh Thomas said it's like we were married. That's how close to they worked. They made that way out. <laughs> 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 that was like, mm -hmm. What Brock put it down, he said that it was like we were mountain climbers going up a cliff. So they rode together, one goes up, knocks in the nail. Right. Ties it off, stays there while the other guy climbs up to him and then goes above him, knocks the next one. Right. They're just working their way up to go like this. That's how Brock described it. And Brock's writing he said that mountain was too steep for any one man to do it by himself. That's what they're trying to achieve here. And these days, when we look back at the history of Cuba, one of the things we find is that most of the major racial ideas are coming from Brock. And what he was going out there, and the cops are going, yeah, but you know what you could do with that? And it's just something that is the thing to remember, right? But it's like brought the idea that the cops are going to I see what you mean, but have you thought about this? And, and it takes that next step forward. So we'll look at Brock. We've got some good Brock here. We'll look at the rest of this and move on to synthetic humanism on Tuesday. Uh, we'll also pick up how they got there. As well, uh, what brought this along because it didn't just come out of nowhere, right? Uh, on Tuesday as well. So um, Saturday at 11:30, you can ask the gallery you can make it. It's not a required thing, but it's you know it's there. And again, if it's small around 11:45 and nobody's there, Mark's going to go get beer, right? So or a sandwich or something like that. So um, you know, just, just, and shoot me. I mean, you 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 know, last time I got a new smartphone and it's smarter. So I will get my email down because the old one was not working well. Okay? That's my office phone. Yeah. No bother. Don't, don't, yeah, that's, no. I don't, I don't give out my cell phone number. 
because it's not been a good thing in the past.